This is the third part of our lecture on processes. This last bit of our one lecture dive into processes is a new mechanism for communication with a process. We know about I.O., we know about command line arguments, now we will learn about signals. Let's dive into this idea with one more new demystification of something you probably saw very early in COS 126. When you've got an infinite loop, press Ctrl C to break the loop and quit out of the program. When you press Ctrl C, the keyboard controller raises an interrupt to the CPU. The OS notices the interrupt and handles it, reading the data from the keyboard and determining what to do with that data. Typically, this would be handed over to the process that's currently reading from the keyboard. But in the case of Control c it instead interprets the keyboard input as a request for the OS to make an exception to the normal execution of the running process, and indicate that that process has some status that needs immediate attention. This OS injection of the notification into the process's normal execution is a signal. The process, upon receipt of the signal, has either the default or custom mechanism for handling each signal. In the case of control C, the notification is signal number two, sig int, int here is interrupt, but that's sort of a misnomer as any of these signals is an interrupt. And the default behavior is to terminate the process. Kind of drastic. In the case of control Z, which you might have also seen, the notification is signal 20, sig stop, a terminal stop. And the default behavior is to stop the execution of the process, but don't terminate it. Put it in a suspend, suspended state until you receive a sig cunt for continue. There's a third signal that the user at the terminal can send, one that you perhaps haven't seen. Signal 3, sig quit. Unsurprisingly, given its name, the default handler is also to terminate the process. So here are those steps summarized into a nice list. Another example of a signal is our old frenemy sig seg v, the segmentation fault which gets raised when we execute an instruction that makes an illegal memory access. Again, OS gets control of the CPU due to the interrupt. It sends the signal, signal 11 in this case, to the process, and the process receives the signal, it handles it. The default reaction for signal 11, as we're all well too aware by now, is to terminate the process. So generalizing a bit, when process P is executing, if there's an exception, an exceptional occurrence that breaks the standard control flow of the program, again, this is different from a Java exception. Examples here include keyboard shortcut triggers an interrupt, or a memory access triggers a seg fault, or another process traps to the OS to request to send a signal directly. Um, we'll see that later. Um, when there's this, uh, this exception, at the exception, the OS gains control of the CPU to handle the exception, and it notifies the target process of the exceptional situation. The OS sends a signal, which is really just setting a bit in the status bits of the process. Sometime later, the process resumes. It, pr it gets control of the CPU again. And oftentimes, actually, this is immediately, as signals are often notifications that should be handled immediately. So the, S, the OS would have good reason to um, context switch back into P at this point, so it can receive the signal. But whatever it is, the OS notes that the status bit for process P, um, it notifies P that the bit, bit was set, and then it clears the bit and triggers P's signal handler, whichever that is, whether it's the default one or the custom one. If there is a custom signal handler for this exception in P, then P will execute that signal handler, which might do all sorts of things, including terminating the process. Otherwise, each signal does have a default behavior set by the OS. If P survives the signal, that is, the, the either default behavior wasn't to terminate or the, um, there was a custom handler that, that didn't terminate, P will continue executing as normal after the signal handler completes. So this means that you can think of handling the signal, in the case where the process doesn't terminate, as only a temporary step away from the normal control flow. But it is a step away from the control flow nonetheless. Beyond keyboard shortcuts like Control c and Control z and Control backslash there are other ways to send signals to a process. One other way is the rather severely named kill command, in which you specify a signal and uh, process to receive that signal. Despite the command's name, the signal can be any signal, not just sig kill. And the process can be a process ID or a shell job identifier. Clearly, though, you must own the process that you're trying to send a signal to or be an administrator. 
For example, oftentimes students leave infinite looping code uh, running on ArmLab. We saw an example of this earlier. Um, and while normally we just send nagging emails to students to kill off their own jobs, sometimes an administrator might go ahead and issue kill commands to do so directly. So how does this command work? The kill command itself issues a trap to the OS because sending a signal is something that requires elevated permissions. So it says, OS, I need you to do something on my behalf. Similarly, imagine that you began a command that you wanted to run in the background. One option would be, as we saw, kill it and start over again with the ampersand after the command. Yeah, that's the sort of uh, natural way to say, ah, that wasn't what I meant to run. Cancel, go away, now restart with what I wanted. But killing it seems harsh, especially if you don't realize that you didn't run it in the background until maybe a long time has elapsed, and so you, you'd be wasting a lot of work. So instead, you could send it a sig stop with uh, control Z, and then once it's suspended, issue the command BG, which puts the uh, process in the background, and then sends a sig cont to the suspended uh, process to continue. So in this way, rather than killing it off and having to start from scratch, we can just sort of pause it, put it in the background, and then restart. There are, of course, a lot more than just these few signals you've seen so far, um, and we can see uh, the all the signals predefined on a system using the same kill command with minus L option for list. Um, so the man pages continue to be a fantastic resource as well. Man 7 signal shows you the disposition, that is the default action, for each of the signals, and it offers additional information about working with signals beyond the scope of this lecture. So continuing with more options to send a signal, we saw um, from the, the shell, we can see that a program also can send a signal to itself with the raise function call. Frankly, this seems a bit odd. One might reasonably question, why would you want to send yourself signals, particularly ones that so often end up with termination? One use is to send yourself uh, signals that don't have any default meaning in order to track the logic of your program. But to me, this feels like an even worse version of GoTo in terms of hijacking the uh, natural flow of control in your program. Um, but there is one clever use in the manuals, however, so um, you can have a look there. Essentially, it's to have a signal handler to clean up upon receiving the signal, but still end up following the default signal behavior. A more natural thing, though, would be to send a signal to a different process. Much like the kill command in Unix, um, the kill function is a bit overzealously named and over-specifically named. It can be used to send any signal to a process that is owned by the same user as the program calling kill. As you might expect, I can't send a signal from my process to yours to terminate your process. That just wouldn't be fair. Same as at the shell level. While this can be used to terminate another process that you're following, it can also have a more mundane use. Uh, namely, it can serve as a somewhat sporting form of inter-process communication. Um, what one common example here is to use it as an implementation of a heartbeat that indicates to another process that um, this process has not terminated. Oh, I received the signal from them. They're still alive in order to send me that. So as we've been talking about signals, I've mentioned the default handler for each of them. So we should talk about signal handlers in general, which um, if raise or signal are, are analogous to Java's throw for exceptions, signal handlers are analogous to Java's corresponding catch for exceptions. A signal handler is simply the reaction that a program will have upon receiving a signal. So every signal uh, has a default reaction, um, and for many of them it's terminating the process. So if you do man 7 signal again, you'll, you'll get a table of all of them and their default actions. Um, but you can see that you can also ignore the signal, stop the process, or continue the process if currently stopped. But also the program can install a custom handler, a function that will run upon receipt of the signal uh, in place of the default handler. This could be as simple as because it doesn't want to terminate under the condition that it gets a particular signal, but it could also be a means to clean up the state of the process, such as sending a disconnect message to an open network uh, socket, or finalizing a database record, or closing some files before succumbing to the necessary termination. So the way that a program can install a signal handler is with the function called signal, which, further lamenting the use of the term kill before, probably should have been the name for that function that sends a signal instead, and, but in fact it's the function for um, installing a handler for a signal. Bad naming, alas, moving on. Um, so signal takes two arguments, the signal that it's installing a handler for, and the function that will be the handler. On success, it returns the old handler, 
This is convenient because it allows you to save that behavior to reuse if you're alternating between opposite signal handling behavior over the course of your program. And though we can write arbitrary signal handler functions, there are two specially predefined SIG handler values that um, we should know about, uh, SIG DFL and SIG IGN. So SIG DFL restores the default handler. Think of this as uninstalling the custom handler if there is one. And SIG IGN ignores the signal altogether. Think of this as a shortcut so that you don't have to, write to, to bother to write out an empty do-nothing signal handler. So before we look at an example, I should mention that there are also some signals that the program may not install a handler for. Um, and so uh, there is uh, no way to handle it in any different way than the default. One is signal 19, SIG stop. We saw this was used in conjunction with SIG cont uh, to suspend and resume a process's execution, respectively. The other that cannot be handled is signal 9, SIG kill which is why you'll sometimes hear kill minus nine used as a verb, since it's a way the shell can kill off a process and be pretty darn sure that process will in fact terminate, since after all, there's no way for a program to handle that signal. So now we're ready for an example. First things first, in order to use the signal function as we see here, we have this pound defying GNU source uh, thing. Um, so the, the short version of the story is that there are various versions of different libraries, including the C standard library, so much for being standard. Um, and it's, it, this, uh, this macro is uh, telling the preprocessor which versions header files to import into the top of the program. So it's really just which version of the standard library. In this case, um, the decision impacts signal handling in two ways. Uh, first of all, it, it exposes a type, uh, type def, uh, sig handler underscore t in the interface and a few um, additional signal-related function prototypes. Additionally, um, different library versions do different things when a primitive like read or write, um, the, the lowest level um, signal, uh, signal calls for, uh, sorry, system calls or uh, system level functions for I.O. Um, are, in, are interrupted by a signal. So uh, the POSIX standard, POSIX is the, the standard in operating systems, um, is to have uh, the primitive fail immediately uh, it's clear, but often inconvenient because it results in many checks for error codes, and we all know how easy it is to forget to, to put one of those in. So uh, instead of uh, POSIX, we have the GNU source, um, which uh, uh, resumes the primitive once the handler is complete. So it's sort of a, a niche sort of uh, nuance here, but just in case you hadn't seen that before, it's a macro that tells us which version of the C uh, standard library to use. All right, with that aside, we can look at the structure of the program. In main, we install a handler for sigint, and the handler is just a function that indicates the signal has been received. The program then prints a message, then enters an infinite loop. With the signal handler installed, control C will not terminate this program, and instead will print the message over and over and over again. But other signals are unaffected. Here's another example. In this case, instead of only handling sigint, we're going to try and handle every signal. Of course, we know we can't do that. Sig kill and others can't be, can't be uh, handled. So here, we can mash at all the keyboard shortcuts we know about, and we won't terminate our program. Um, I actually had to go to another window here and invoke a kill command on the process in order to kill it off. Uh, note also that it fails to install 32 and 33, because these are controlled by the, uh, the POSIX uh, thread library. Um, uh, in the, the glibc version in our, our pound define, but again, beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. This is, you know, again, a, a, a corner case where this particular version of the standard library does something special with those so you can't change how they're handled. For a third example, let's consider an example that's less artificial, one that we might actually use in practice. This program generates a lot of data and prints it to a temporary log file but it then removes the files before finishing the program. That way it doesn't clutter the file system or run into some sort of quota. So what happens to this log file if the user presses Control c Pause the video here and take a moment to think about it before moving on to the next slide. When the user types Control c the OS sends a sigint to the process. The sigint will terminate the process and thus never get back to the remove call in main. So if we want to be sure that the file will be cleaned up upon exit from the program, unless someone killed minus nines it, we should install a signal handler. 
and in that signal handler we can do the cleanup that we want and then exit as we otherwise would have with the signal. So in this file we have a function cleanup that closes the file descriptor, removes the file, and exits. We install that function as the handler for SIGINT. And furthermore, to, to avoid duplicating code, albeit at the cost of slightly less clear uh, flow of control, we could even unconditionally call this function at the end of the program even if we didn't receive a signal. The last system level function we're going to talk about is the special system call that asks the operating system to begin a countdown to send the calling process a signal, specifically a sig alarm, signal 14, at the end of that countdown. This is a pretty useful, useful function because it allows us to implement timeouts. We can be sure that no matter what code we're about to start executing, we can get back from it in a certain amount of time. After all, because signals interrupt the normal flow of control. Typically, this will be combined with installing a handler for SIG alarm because the default disposition for SIG alarm is to terminate the process. So it'd be sort of weird to say, in 17 seconds, terminate my process, no matter what I'm doing. A better thing would be to say, in 17 seconds, call this other function, no matter what I'm doing. So let's look at an example. Pause the video and take a few moments to reason about what this program will do. In this program, we set a handler for SIG alarm, then invoke the alarm system call to ask to receive a SIG alarm from the OS in two seconds. The program then enters an infinite loop as before. Two seconds into executing that infinite loop, the OS will send a SIG alarm signal, which will be handled by the signal handler, printing a message. But then, instead of exiting, the handler prints and reinvokes the system call and drops out of the function. At this point, when we're done with the handler, the program will continue ex uh, executing exactly where it was when it received the, sis the signal, sitting in the infinite loop. But, in the handler, we reset the alarm, so two more seconds later, the same thing will happen. Handler will get called, it will print, it will re-invoke the alarm again, and resume where we left off. This will continue forever until terminated by some other signal. Here's another program, our very last sample program of this monster lecture. So if your stamina persists, now is the time to pause the video and see if you can reason about what this program is going to do. In this program, we, had, we set a handler for SIG alarm, then invoked the alarm system call to ask to receive SIG alarm from the OS in five seconds. This time, instead of an infinite loop, the program attempts to uh, get input from the user. It prompts for, for standard input. After the scanf, if we have indeed received the requested information from the user, it cancels the alarm with alarm zero. Alarm zero says cancel any existing alarm, and then it will confirm the input. But that's if the user enters the input quickly. If, on the other hand, the user doesn't respond for five seconds, then the alarm is going to trigger and the sorry message will print. This can prevent a program from sitting around wasting resources while the user is out to lunch or gone for the weekend. And it's pretty nifty because it's something that the application program hadn't up until this point been able to do. Scanf is a blocking call, so once we call that function, we previously had no way to advance beyond that instruction and we were at the mercy of the user waiting uh, to return to our control flow. We had to get the input in order for, st uh, for ScanF to return to us. Now we have a way to preempt it. So I hope this lecture series has given you a bit of a better sense about the, the processes that we've been talking about uh, this entire semester. We keep saying the word process with no real definition there. So here's been a, a reasonable dive into what is a process and what are some of the considerations uh, um, uh, about them when running your programs. Um, also about the shell that you've been using to invoke your programs, and the types and uh, detail of analysis and topics uh, that you can look forward to in your systems departmentals down the line. So next time we'll see an overview of your fourth assignment, which will then uh, be covered in greater detail in precepts next week.